Today's presentation will be about memory bandwidth, which is a specific type of um, noisy neighbor problem that we've run into at Google. Uh, the team is David. Hi, everyone. Me and Rohit. And it's a project that's a collaboration between platforms and Google Borg, which is the Google Cluster Management System. At Google, we like to have our clusters full of jobs. As high utilization, the higher, the better. So we end up running a mix of high and low priority jobs with various latency degrees of latency sensitive uh, down to batch workloads. And we handle the isolation part through bare metal containers, so C groups and namespaces. And for monitoring, we use both C groups and perf, uh, the perf infrastructure in Linux. The same for, for enforcement, we use C groups and hardware controls. Uh, we also use cluster level strategies to balance the resource requirements. So this talk will focus on memory bandwidth. And what we see is that at uh, when memory bandwidth usage becomes high enough, the performance of the whole system, the speed of memory, band memory uh, accesses decreases and the whole system is affected. In the image shown on this slide, we see the latency of a sensitive job that gets basically doubled as soon as a memory bandwidth intensive job starts. And this kind of behavior can and periodically causes significant uh, performance degradation in our clusters. Of course, some workloads are more uh, seriously affected than others, and it does not, uh, it's not proportional to your memory bandwidth use. So if your job uses little memory bandwidth, it can still be very much affected when memory bandwidth becomes saturated. Uh, not only this, but the problem becomes increasingly worse over time. So this chart shows just this year how much worse the, the problem has become. The, the chart counts the number of distinct machines that get affected by memory bandwidth saturation for at least one um, timestamp during the day. We believe it's becoming a bigger issue because of two separate reasons. First, machines are becoming bigger and bigger, which means that if we want to keep a certain level of utilization, we will pack more and more jobs on the machines, thus increasing the probability that one of the jobs will abuse some resource on the system. And at Google, a specific type of workload, which we know is very memory bandwidth intensive, is ML, with the increasing amount of memory uh, of uh, ML that happens, it becomes more and more likely that we'll run into this issue. All right, thanks Dragos for uh, motivating the need to control the memory bandwidth in the system. So in the next part of this talk, we'll go into how we determine there's a memory bandwidth problem on the system and the mechanisms that we have available to control the issue. So let me now talk to you about how we detect there's even an issue in the first place. So on modern CPUs, in the Uncore, specifically an integrated memory controller in the co uh, coherent home agent, there are performance monitoring facilities that tell you how much memory bandwidth is being consumed and the local versus remote breakdown of that memory bandwidth. Once we started collecting this information fleet-wide and we plumbed it for our infrastructure for analysis, now we could start doing some uh, performance characterizations to figure out how much memory bandwidth we can tolerate on the machine before the performance of latency-sensitive tasks starts dropping. So we do this characterization for every platform, and in this magic number, uh, we call the saturation threshold. And so this is basically, you can think of it as uh, the knee in the curve, where below that, the performance is fine. But as soon as you cross that threshold, uh, the performance degradation starts going off a cliff, and you have a bad time. In the next slide, uh, we characterize the saturation variances by platforms and clusters. So due to the heterogeneous nature of Google's fleet, we have multiple kinds of uh, uh, hardware platforms within the fleet and within a uh, cluster. This means that we actually get different kinds of saturation behavior. It's not just, oh, you have uh, all machines will behave the same. 
So depending on the memory bandwidth to the number of CPU cores ratio, some platforms have less memory bandwidth and more cores. Other platforms have the other kind uh, inverse ratio. Then you get different levels of saturation per platform. And as I mentioned, due to the heterogeneous nature of our clusters, we actually see saturation in different clusters at different times of the day or at different uh, days of the week or different months of the year. So it's very wide variance. It doesn't all happen at the same time. Okay, so we can now get the data per socket to determine if there's a problem. The next step is to then go attribute the memory bandwidth usage to particular workloads. It's not very helpful to just know that there's a problem and then try to guess who's causing the problem by looking at CPU usage. Because what we've seen is that there are tasks that can use a lot of CPU, but because you know, they're very cache friendly or they're not doing very much uh, data accesses, they don't consume a lot of memory bandwidth. While there's other kinds of tasks that are just streaming through lots of data, so they don't consume as much CPU, but they can basically blow out the entire memory bandwidth of a single socket using, say, five CPUs, right? So we need to be able to accurately figure out how much memory bandwidth each task is using. And we need this in order to identify both tasks that are what we call abusers. These are tasks that are consuming more memory bandwidth than we'd like them to, as well as tasks that we call victims. These are the tasks that, when co-located on a machine with high memory bandwidth usage, you get the kind of latency uh, cliff that Drago showed earlier. So on new platforms, specifically uh, Broadwell and uh, Skylake from Intel, there's actually hardware capabilities in order to get this information per task. However, when we started out doing this work, um, it was actually challenging to use these new hardware features. The first reason was because the uh, Intel RDTC group was on its way out, it was being deprecated, and the new uh, system in the kernel in order to interface with the hardware, Res which we'll talk about a bit more later, that was not ready yet for us to use. And the second challenge is that, again, Google has a very heterogeneous fleet. This means a lot of legacy old hardware platforms that don't have this hardware support. And these platforms were also experiencing memory bandwidth saturation problems. So we also needed some way of getting information from those older platforms. Uh, so for our purposes, we actually could get away with a rough estimation of memory if we didn't need to count exactly every single byte going across the memory bus. Typically, when we saw saturation, there's a couple of large abusers responsible for that memory bandwidth usage. So as long as you're in the ballpark range, you could, oh, oh. I, uh, I blame this on a memory bandwidth contention. <laughs> uh, so as long as you can, within the ballpark range, identifies who's using most of the bandwidth, that's good enough for control purposes. Okay, so how do we do this per task memory bandwidth estimation? A uh, summary of the requirements is that you know, we need this local remote breakdown so we know exactly how much traffic is being sent to which socket that's seeing the issue. And because of the way we run uh, uh, tasks at Google, they're all in containers, we need uh, this method to be compatible with the C group model. So let's take a quick tour of what's available in the hardware and see which ones we can make work. So the most obvious hardware feature is uncore counters. These are the integrated memory controller, the coherent home agent. If you're not familiar with what those are in the hardware, I'm showing a little cartoon on the right that you know, shows basically where they sit logically. So you may think these things are great for measuring memory bandwidth. After all, these are the things that are closest to your DRAM in the system. However, it's very difficult to attribute counts on these counters back to the individual hyperthread, which we need to do in order to do the C group attribution properly. So uncore counters are out. Is there anything else we can use? Turns out that the uh, CPU PMU counters, or performance monitoring unit counters, they're actually very well suited for this task. The counters are hyperthread local, which means we can get counts per hyperthread. That's great. We can do the C group attribution properly. And secondly, using the perf subsystem in the Linux kernel, it actually already supports C group profiling mode. We didn't have to jump through any extra hoops to make this work with the C group model. OK, so we're going to use PMU counters. Now the question is which counter to use. Go look at the uh, Intel manual. It's a very long list of counters. It's very difficult to tell which one is actually useful for this. So I'll save you all that trouble and tell you that off-core response is the counter to use. So here I'll just give a very brief overview of what it is. It's a programmable, uh, it's a PMU with a programmable filter. So you can say, tell me all the memory accesses that were serviced by the local memory or by the remote memory. And one very nice thing about this uh, counter is that it can also capture 
uh, on-demand load and prefetch traffic as well. So it can get a pretty comprehensive view of memory bandwidth uh, used by workload. So there's also uh, do online documentation by Intel and what all the little bits mean. You can look at that uh, offline. But the general way to interpret this counter is that you can see how many counts go by, and then you just multiply that by the cache line size, which is 64 bytes on Intel CPUs, and then that tells you how, much, how many bytes have, uh, this uh, C group has transferred. With this approach that David presented, it helped us gather some insights about the problem and how it relates to the workload on the machine. First, we gathered abuser insights, which showed that uh, a large percentage of time, one or two uh, high memory bandwidth consumers are soaking up all of the memory bandwidth. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that the sh CPU share of these consumers does not match the proportion that we see that y them using memory bandwidth. Another insight is for victims. We did not know how often do we care about memory bandwidth saturation, and it turns out that a large percentage of jobs are actually sensitive and lose performance due to it. Another thing that came out of this is uh, that we found out jobs who are sensitive don't actually use a lot of memory bandwidth, they could be using very little. And also on, based on this approach, we were able to gather guidance on various enforcement options that we were considering. Uh, we wanted to know how much saturation would we fix by doing X, how much would we fix by doing Y, which jobs would be affected in a way that we would, not, we would prefer not to. And based on these insights, we decided on the following inform enforcement approach, uh, which is guided a lot by the needs of the jobs and the SLOs that we promised them. So on the x-axis, we look at the memory bandwidth usage of the job, uh, moderate meaning the job would not saturate uh, another machine if we were to move it to another machine. Um, heavy would mean that if we're trying to move it, it's probably going to cause the same issue all over again. On the y-axis, we have the various priorities that the jobs could have. So if we look at jobs of low priority, we decided to simply throttle the jobs, decreasing their throughput, but also their memory bandwidth, thus saving the machine. For jobs of high priority, we want them to never be impacted, so we decided to isolate them, removing any other jobs from the machine that may use memory bandwidth. The interesting part is what do we do for jobs of medium priority? Because if they use a lot of memory bandwidth, moving them around would jo just move the problem around to the new machine. So if they, use, if they are heavy memory bandwidth user, we will disable these jobs. If instead they only use part of the memory bandwidth in the system, we use this approach called reactive rescheduling that I'm going to discuss on a subsequent slide. So this, there are two types, high-level types of approach, node-based approach, approaches and cluster-wide approaches. For node-based, we um, discussed and will discuss more about memory bandwidth allocation support in hardware. And for older platform, uh, platforms, what we can do is we can indirectly control memory bandwidth by CPU throttling. We would limit CPU access, thus decreasing the amount of memory bandwidth used. Cluster approaches consist of this reactive re, uh, evictions and rescheduling approach that I mentioned. Uh, basically, the scheduler would move jobs around to, to machines that have lower memory bandwidth utilization. And the heavy hammer disabling the, the jobs who really abuse the cell. So if you look in detail at the CPU throttling uh, approach, because it reduces basically arbitrarily the CPU uh, accessible to the task, it can be very effective in reducing saturation. And it's got the considerable advantage that it works on all of our platforms. The disadvantage is it's very coarse in granularity and it's indiscriminate in the sense that it slows down any thread whether it accesses uh, memory or not. It also has a, a big disadvantage of poor interaction with load balancing because if a load balancer looks at a job and sees that it's using very little CPU, whereas it 
requested a lot, it's going to assume that, oh, there's very little workload. Let's send some more requests to it. Whereas in practice, that job is limited and the queue of requests is climbing. So how are we doing the throttling? Uh, with the, based on the uh, sockets and C group counters, we run periodically a memory, saturate, memory bandwidth saturation detector, um, which will decide if the socket memory bandwidth is over the saturation threshold that we decide. If it is, then we run the attribution part, which uh, is based on both socket and C group perf counters. The output is a set of tasks. Out of them, a policy filter based on SLO will select a subset of them that are eligible for throttling. And then an enforcer decreases the CPU runnable mask for these uh, tasks. On the other hand, if we detect that saturation has disappeared, maybe due, due to the throttling that we apply, we may decide if the socket memory bandwidth is lower than uh, another threshold, a lower one, then we can unthrottle the tasks and the enforcer will increase the CPU runnable masks. The key takeaway here is that we can use this hysteresis uh, mechanism, basically a uh, use of two different thresholds to uh, keep the approach from being too bouncy. So the hardware approach is called memory bandwidth allocation and we're going to discuss a bit more about it later. Uh, but the idea is that there's a request rate controller uh, somewhere between the L2 cache and the high-speed interconnect that allows us to slow down the memory accesses of, uh, on a per app basis. Uh, it's for newer platform all only, so it would not help all our, all our uh, clusters. And it also has its own, its own issues that we'll detail later. Going to the cluster approaches, we have reactive rescheduling, uh, which is an approach that we use when the, sat the, the cluster is, has saturated sockets, but the fraction of them is not too high. And the jobs that are causing saturation don't use heavy memory bandwidth, so they would not saturate the socket if we were to move them around. And how this works is when the host dis discovers that it's saturated by profiling the socket, it's going to call, call for help to an observer and give it a list of jobs that use memory bandwidth. The observer will decide to evict somebody and ask the scheduler to do so, which will then evict the job and reschedule it on a host that's lightly loaded. Unfortunately, the rescheduling approach does not work if the cell lo utilization looks like this. Basically, most of the machines being uh, at least medium, <coughs> mediumly used on memory bandwidth. And so for situations like the one on the bottom, we have to use bigger hammers, in this case, disabling abusers. So we look at collections that saturate a lot of machines and pick which one to, de uh, to disable based on its priority. There are a few alternatives that we considered here that we can discuss later. Uh, users, once disabled, they are, can either reconfigure their service to maybe let us throttle them, a different priority, uh, or switch to another cluster which is light, more lightly loaded. So the results. So if we evaluate CPU throttling, uh, we see that at least in combination with cry for help, it's helpful in reducing about 71%. It's successful at removing saturation in about 71% of the time. Uh, another 20 something percent, we just have no candidates, no low priority jobs that we could throttle. For the rebalancing approach, we have a very interesting situation where we uh, avoid the saturation about 30% of the time. There's 49, 40 percent of the time when we can't use this approach due to job SLO. And another 30 percent of the time where we have what we call to, uh, tolerated saturation. For uh, rescheduling, we don't want to trigger it immediately as soon as the problem shows up. Because the uh, Spikes in memory bandwidth saturation, like in instantaneous spikes that disappear immediately after, would cause too many evictions 
It's too, too much toil in the scheduler and too much uh, work lost on the jobs moving around. All right, so up to this point, you may be wondering, okay, this is you know, all very nice work, but where, what does that have to do with the Linux kernel? And if you're wondering that, I thank you for your patience. We're about to get into details of how hardware QoS mechanisms interact with the Linux kernel, our experiences with that subsystem, as well as you know, a community call for action. So uh, some audience participation question. Uh, raise your hands if you heard of res control, class of service ID, RMID. Oh, wow, that's actually more people than I expected. OK, well, so the vast majority of people in this room haven't heard this, so I'll give a quick uh, tour throughout these concepts so then uh, you can understand later when I'm uh, talking about our experiences using the subsystem. So res control stands for resource control. It's a new unified interface in a kernel to manage uh, hardware quality of service uh, features. And so to us, this is a big improvement over the previous non-standard RDT C group interface. That one, we tried to make some more changes to it. The upstream maintainers didn't like it. So then they sent, they sent uh, actually the Intel folks back to the drawing board, and then they came up with this uh, res control uh, file system. So it's actually seeing a lot of adoption within uh, different vendors and uh, different architectures. Both AMD, ARM, and Intel have uh, patches and proposals upstream to make use of this uh, system. And the system is also uh, very rich in features. It supports uh, hardware memory bandwidth monitoring and isolation, as well as last level cache monitoring and isolation as well. So res control is a software layer. So now I'll give a quick introduction to exactly you know, what in the hardware it's managing. So the Google use case for uh, resource isolation is to have lots of different workloads running on each machine. Each of those workloads corresponds to one container. And we may have a small number of quality of service configs. For example, maybe the high priority latency sensitive things to get more cache, get more memory bandwidth, but the low priority batch workloads, which want to constrain how much cache they can use, who don't want them to use too much memory bandwidth in the system. And so this naturally leads to a model where you have a small number of a class of service IDs. These are things that map to unique QoS configs in the hardware. But at the same time, we want to have very fine-grained monitoring of each workload running the system. So this means that we want to have lots of what are called uh, resource monitoring IDs or RMIDs, because that way we can hand out one RMID to every workload. So that way we can exactly find out who's using how much memory bandwidth, so then we can go throttle them later. OK, so this is a very quick uh, overview of the res control file system. There's a lot more files and directories in the actual file system. So here I'm only going to uh, present the things that are relevant to this talk. So a uh, res control file system is organized as a multiple uh, res control groups or resource control group. In each group today, it corresponds to one hardware class of service ID. So that is important detail that will come up again later. Then within each res control group, uh, you have two files. You have the schemata file, which is a human readable file that tells you, oh, here's how much resources this res control group should be getting in hardware, as well as the task file, which specifies which FRED IDs belong to this res control group. Then within a res control group, you also have uh, the monitoring aspect. Uh, so this is captured under the mon groups. Uh, so each mon group represents one unique uh, hardware RMID. And again, uh, it also has a task file which specifies which threads belong to that particular resource monitoring group. And um, then there's also data associated with that resource monitoring group as well. You can go in and you can get the cache occupancy or how much memory bandwidth has been used. Uh, in addition, there's also a top level uh, mon data associated with each res control group. This tells you the total amount of uh, resources that everything in that res control group is using. Okay, so in this slide, I'm just going to give a brief uh, example of, of what you can see in the res control uh, file system. So if you can go look at the schemata, you can see here how much uh, L3 cache a res control sh group should get, how much memory bandwidth it should get, and then you can set them by just uh, echoing uh, lines into the schemata. Then to uh, get a reading, you can then just uh, read out a file. You can then wait a little bit of time, read it out again. Then you compute the delta to get the rate. And so in this case, if you wait one second and you read it twice, 
do the subtraction, we're saying that this particular MOM group is consuming about 1.8 gigabytes per second. Okay, so that's the existing uh, res control interface in Linux kernel. So let's now try to fit the R container model in Borg onto this res control. Um, here's a, a hint. It didn't work so well the first time we tried it. So our use case is to dynamically apply memory bandwidth throttling to uh, workloads that are consuming too much memory bandwidth when the machine is in trouble. So to set this up, first you create two different res control groups, one for no throttling, one with throttling, and then when you have a new C group that comes in, then you have to first go uh, create a mon group in, in one res control group, and then when that C group starts up, then you have to start putting tasks into the res control group, and you have to do that one at a time. Then you then have to do that again in the mon group, and then now your C group has started. Then when it comes time to, uh, uh, you then detect that C group is causing memory bandwidth problems. You then want to move it to the bandwidth throttled res control group. So then you have to then move all the TIDs over, right? You know, 30 second description, sounds easy, sounds fine. It's the big deal. So it turns out devil's in the details and actually as currently designed, it creates a lot of complexity and toil for the node agent software to use res control. Specifically, um, at Google, there can be tasks that create thousands of threads. So recall that you have to put each thread into the task file one at a time, not very fast, pretty expensive to do so. And one more, and a more subtle issue is that when these uh, tasks are creating threads, you can actually get a race condition where between when you started putting TIDs into the file and when you finish, some new threads have been created in that time. So you have to keep on cycling through, putting threads in until you're reasonably confident that you got all the threads. Now you need to do this three times, right? Twice at the beginning when you create it, and third when you need to reassign the uh, quality of service config. Another challenge that we faced, which is a functionality challenge, is that um, when you try to move a particular task into a different uh, resource control group, you can't actually move the mon group with it. You have to go reinstantiate that new monitoring group, which causes a new RMID to be allocated and assigned to this task. And in the meanwhile, on your CPU, all that data you brought into the L3 is associated with that old RMID, right? So then now you have this new RMID and this phantom old RMID, and it's very difficult to then get the correct data for last level cache occupancy monitoring. Okay, so. We then asked ourselves our question, you know, this is not great, how do we make it better? And the main idea is here is, what if we now had the ability to have a one-to-one -one mapping of containers to res control groups, right? Then this way, when we want to change a QS config, all we do is rewrite the schemata, boom, done. We don't have to move the TIDs around, we get to keep the existing RMID so we don't get the L3 occupancy desynchronization issue, and, it's also 100% compatible with the existing res control abstraction, right? It's an implementation detail that each res control group happens to require one class of service ID, right? So the challenge, as I just alluded to, is that with the existing system, you're gonna run out of class of service IDs very quickly, right? On the Skylake, you try creating six, uh, actually 15 res control groups. That's it, you can't create any more. Right? But at Borg, we want to run potentially hundreds of containers. Right? So the solution to this is to essentially share class of service IDs. Recall that from earlier, we only have a small finite number of uh, QoS configs. So we essentially, we want to dedupe these configs. So as long as you have the same config, you should get the same class of service ID. Right? There's no need to have 10 different class of service IDs that all have the exact same configuration. And so uh, Google has developed a kernel patch to enable this functionality, and it will be hopefully be released soon in the next couple of weeks. Um, Stefan and the audience here did a lot of hard work to make that happen. And uh, the main takeaway point that I want to that I want all of you to leave with is that this really demonstrates the need to make the container model a first class consideration when designing kernel interfaces to manage hardware quality of service mechanisms. Right, because the original design was, it was honestly, it was designed for more HPC type of use case, right? The, the container model wasn't really thought of. So then when we tried to fit containers on top of it, it was like putting a square peg through a circular hole. 
You can do it, it's just not very pretty and it leads to a lot of unnecessary complications. Okay, so to close this all out, now let's see at how simple it is after we make this change. So again, same use case, we want to dynamically apply memory bandwidth throttling to abusers. So in this case, what we do is now we just uh, create a new res control group when we start the C group, uh, write in the no throttling, config in a schemata, move the TIDs into the task file. Notice how we only have to do that once now as opposed to twice. And when we need to apply throttling, we just remind rewrite the schemata with the new frawling configuration, and that's it. We're done. So after we saw the, the final solution, we do have some conclusions about interacting between C groups, uh, container runtimes, then microarchitectural enforcement or monitoring tools. We believe that the uh, a big reason for the success of this project is the good interaction between the two. And interfaces, the interfaces that we have now aren't the, very well suited for this. So we would love to contribute to a standard framework around performance management for container runtimes that would integrate both, to, uh, both of, these, of these approaches. So what are the takeaways from, from this talk? Uh, as time goes on, we see uh, busy na uh, noisy neighbor uh, and resource isolation, low level resource isolation problems become more and more frequent. And the key to controlling them is continuous monitoring and enforcement, especially when you want to have multi-tenant hosts where the workload may not be well behaved all the time. For the work described in, in this talk, we plan to do two current extent, two extensions to improve the success rate. Uh, we also want to gather feedback about uh, building a general framework that would help collaboration in the community uh, for C group and rest control interaction. And Longer term, we are looking into doing better scheduling ahead of time for memory bandwidth um, control based on hints that we could detect uh, based on past job behavior and known job sensitivities. In conclusion, I also want to say thank you to the more than 10 people who contributed to this project at Google. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, we'll be glad to take them. <laughs> um, when you say isolation, do you mean isolating it on a particular box, or do you mean moving it to a socket with new malware out, um, allocation? So in general, when we talk about isolation or performance isolation, we sort of want to you know, give this, you know, it's, uh, the, the goal is to be able to get to a point where every workload running on the system, they see the same performance as if, you know, they were the only ones running on that system. Right? So that could be, you know, for example, NUMA isolation, as you mentioned, is potentially one mechanism in order to provide that uh, illusion. Okay, so, so NUMA aware allocation is one of your strategies of isolation. In, in your first picture, you had some threads running on this socket, mm -hmm. accessing memory on that socket. And the obvious solution is to rebalance those by moving into the thread. Is that one of the strategies that you, this entails? So uh, we actually consider uh, when you have one socket saturated, uh, you can th balance the workload between the two sockets. But we saw that this frequently would not solve the issue in our case because when one socket is saturated, the other one is also highly loaded. We didn't dig, you know, super deep in, into why this happens, but it may be that jo big jobs may be run on both sockets, and we cannot, you know, uh, this would not work very well. So uh, I have a question on, uh, so uh, in case of uh, GPU workloads, like what you have in TensorFlow or things in there, so primarily, the jobs where the bandwidth is more consumed is via the GPU network. It's not the CPU thread, which is actually generating bandwidth in there. So there, 
the CPU thread is more of just setting up the memory allocations and setting the GPU workload to go. To go. So if you go into throttle based on the memory bandwidth for the CPU thread, that's going to hurt the GPU workload because there you are actually decreasing the um, the workload uh, by not allowing the primary thread to make him uh, allocate memory bandwidth things in there. So how do you handle that? Uh, I think so this is uh, one clarification we didn't probably should have made it earlier that the stuff we are talking about here is running ML models on compute, not on GPUs. So we do something similar for GPUs, but the throttling model is different, and the problem is kind of easier because the machines there are optimized to run GPUs, and we kind of take everything that will uh, disturb those jobs. So this is for running like general learning algorithm on bad jobs in machines that are kind of idle. Are there, so that raises another question, are there other hardware resources, when I first looked at the, the original description, it wasn't just memory bandwidth and cache allocation you could control, there were other um, hardware quality of service um, metrics available. Are you planning to extend to use any of those? So I think today what's available in commercial hardware is just currently last level cache, memory bandwidth, and then there's some more fancy things you can do with the cache, for example, what's called a code data partitioning. So you can say, oh, I allocate some portion to cache for the code versus the data. But you know, in the, in, we, we definitely do you know, see the need for more hardware quality of service mechanism in the future, right? It's, for example, the interconnect between sockets, PCIe, IO, right? There's a lot. Your, your performance isolation illusion is only as strong as the weakest link in the chain, right? So even though you can fix memory bandwidth, you can fix cache, there's always going to be something else that can come up and break your illusion of performance isolation. And so we really look forward to you know, working with vendors and with the community to help enable these mechanisms and to control them in a unified, um, uh, easy uh, fashion. I, I, it, this is re relates to the performance isolation as well. While recognizing that it's so much work, workload dependent, how many times have you had problems with uncontrolled memory bandwidth consumption, things that happen out of band, like worker threads completing I.O., K-Compact D running in the background, which is quite memory bandwidth intensive, VM scan in certain uh, cases and so on. Uh, have you had common problems with uncontrolled bandwidth access, or is it relatively rare in your experience? Um, it's been relatively rare, um, especially all the kernel thread. We do monitor those two and uh, track how much they use. This mostly has been like very much more intensive and continuous things. We see a lot of bursts from kernel, which die down within a second, and none of these things kind of apply there. They don't last that long that it can do something about it. We try to isolate them different ways, try to keep them away from other jobs, but we don't have to go to this extent for those problems. To add Thanks. to that, did you see any of the L1TF mitigations trying to interfere um, or hurt your no, I think um, as we described, right, we have a saturation threshold that's pr probably high enough that LVNTF and other things don't actually push the machines that high. Um, and again, this one happens like not all the time. It's happening like once a day in one cluster for a, f uh, for a few hours. It's big enough to disrupt whatever we are doing, but it's not like every second on a machine and we need to kind of control it at that level. So that's why all our approaches here are more reactive. We do something when we notice it. Um, if it was the other way around, we'll have to do something right at the scheduling time, be very sure what we are allocating everybody, and never let them go across. So we are not there yet. Things can change. So for, for monitoring, like how often do we need to monitor it? How, how intrusive is it? I, I think system. ideally you would do continuous monitoring. Uh, at, at Google, we are not yet at a stage where we, um, where jobs, jobs either are not, you know, affected by short bursts of, of saturation, which is why at least the scheduling, the reactive scheduling works well, uh, or they, you know, tolerate them. Uh, we run them every couple of minutes, the, the checks, so it's a pretty coarse um, monitoring. Uh, done. Uh, that and that seems to be sufficient. Yes. Yeah. 
you monitor every couple of minutes. What's the overhead of monitoring? Could it be smaller? Uh, you're, you're an excellent plant in the audience. <laughs> so, sir, so the socket level monitoring, that one is fairly uh, low overhead because we just go to essentially you know, one hardware block and ask you know, how much memory bandwidth is being consumed. The uh, per task monitoring using the uh, CPU uh, performance counters using the perf subsystem in C group profiling mode, that is very expensive. Right, because in C group mode, now at context switch time, you have to go save and restore all of those uh, performance counters. You have to go find the next thing. It's actually fairly expensive and noticeable. And actually, there are users within Google that have complained very loudly at us for the performance hit that they see on that. So that's actually an issue that you know, we hope to see get addressed, how to make you know, the C group uh, monitoring more lightweight. Because we get a lot of value out of it, as you've seen in today's talk. How do you do uh, CPU throttle? So I think for CPU throttle, it's basically we just restrict the access for the jobs that are using a lot of memory to a fewer CPUs. And they run slower, and they can only access part of the available socket bandwidth. And that's why we keep bringing them down exponentially to see how much we can throttle, and we have a minimum. Um, and we kind of do a mix of both approaches. While we are throttling, and if it's not solving the problem, and we can't go any further down, it already triggers the eviction mechanism and we'll kick somebody out by that time. Thank you. Thank you very much.